We're on maybe, I'm not sure, can we see you? Hello. Hello. Can we see Beverly? Can everyone, because I can't, because my, um, my kind of slides take over my screen. Can someone let me know, can you see Beverly? Are we good to go? Not yes, not yes. Yes, we couldn't. Thank you, Emma. Lovely. Beverly, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very well. We are so thrilled to have you here. So uh, I'll just do a little brief introduction, then I'm going to ask you to maybe share a bit about yourself, lovely one. So Beverly Spell is based in, she's in Louisiana, and uh, Beverly is the founder of Leap and Learn, which is the leading preschool curriculum uh, my gosh, it is just remarkable, and we'll, we'll get you to kind of tell what's so unique about Leap and Learn and quite different to other preschool curriculums out there in a second, Beverly, but what I love about this woman and what I think you guys are all going to really value about what she's going to share with you today is the level of intellect that she brings towards teaching. And that's what really excites me. If we're you know, following on from Karen, actually, with that whole level about really caring about the experience of the child and the education, Beverly embodies that again completely. So, Beverly, would you like to share a little bit about your story and, and you know the studio that you run yourself now and how you actually got to form Leap and Learn and with with Annie and how this all came about? Which I, we would love to just kind of know a little bit about you. Okay, um, I studied ballet as a child. I wanted to be a dancer, professional dancer. I had a phenomenal teacher. I had Gwen Ashton from the Royal Winnipeg Ballet. Actually, moved to Louisiana because she loved our weather, and she was my teacher <laughs> every day for years and years and years. So um, we had excellent training, and I studied on scholarship at School of American Ballet and Harkness Ballet, and you know, always went away. And then at 18, I decided, you know what, I don't want to be a dancer anymore. <laughs> and I wanted to go to school, and I did. I went to college, and um, then I ended up getting married and on. And um, I taught dance throughout the years, but was always struggling with trying to find what was the right way to teach children. You know, mm -hmm. I trained as a professional dancer, but, you know, I was teaching little kids, and I knew that it had to be a different way. And... Mm -hmm. um, Fast forward many years, I have my own school. I started my own school in 1998 because I was still searching for that, that way, best way to teach. And um, my son started dating this wonderful young woman. Her name was Annie Spell. And she was getting her master's in child psychology at the time. And we just started talking. We just started having these long conversations. And it was kind of funny because my son was like, okay, Mom, she's my date. Uh, <laughs> but we would just talk. And you talk can't hijack it, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Which I did. I did. And we would have these long conversations. I'd say, okay, well, you know, I was teaching this child did this, and they did this, and they said this. And, you know, we just, she just started saying, okay, well, it's this theory, and it's this, and why don't you try this? And it was just amazing how it worked. It just worked. Mm -hmm. And um, so we just started implementing everything. We decided to write a curriculum. I had a lot of encouragement from a lot of people in the industry, you know, because it was working within my studio. Mm -hmm. And we wrote a curriculum and we started teaching. And, you know, fast forward many more years. And now it's a it's much more involved curriculum. Uh, and the, uh, the secret is, is first, as a teacher, when you come, when you, learn, leap and learn, you learn how children learn. How do they process mm -hmm. information? What are their stages of development? How are they, how do they see it? You know, we look at things as an adult, but it's a, ch you know, these are children. How do you need to say it? What do you need to do? How far down do you need to break it? So we teach all of that. And once you have that information, you know, you can teach anything. You can teach anything, and you know, and it works whether you're teaching dance, whether you're teaching any group of children. So, um, and that's what we do. And now, Annie's my daughter-in-law, and uh, <laughs> so uh, mother of two grandbabies too. Yeah, she's yeah. she's really part of the part of the family. And it's really interesting. I think that that is quite fascinating. The difference between philosophically, when we 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 have a room of kids in front of us thinking about, okay, instead of just teaching, like, what do they need to know sequentially to know the steps, but instead to kind of take a step, take another step back from that, not about the steps, but to think, how do I need to present the information so that they will absorb and retain and 
um, embody it, I suppose. So, I mean, which is which is quite an interesting philosophy to to really dive into as a teacher. Yes, it's more than it's more than the steps. It's a, it's how you teach the information. Mm. So when Annie and I work together, she's going to teach you why you need to do this and how to do it, and then. I take that information and I turn it into teaching dance, teaching movement. Yeah. But you really so need you to understand how children learn in order to be able to do, you know, to do it successfully. Absolutely. So what would you say, Beverly, are like some of the really clear, and, and I, I'm going to say mistakes, and we don't know necessarily that they're mistakes per se, mm -hmm. but what would you say are the kind of some of the things that teachers may not realize they're doing in their classroom, which actually might be detrimental to the learning, if you know what I mean? One thing would be if you're giving them too much information too soon and they don't have all mm -hmm. the building blocks. So they, uh, they need all the pieces of the puzzle to be able to do a complicated movement, even if it's a complicated movement such as shifting weight as a tonglié. Um, so how would you teach this type of movement where you have the plié, stretch, extend, plié, stretch, extend? So if you, but if you say to the child, okay, we're going to, we're going to, I need you to help me rock my babies. And you have all these little beanie babies and you give them each one and how they're, they're your special baby. You remember how mommy rocked you? Because now you're pulling upon all of their memory stores about, yes, mommy rocked me. Yes, I have a baby to rock. And then you start plie, bending the knees and rocking. And they're focused on the little baby, you know. But guess what? They're starting to do a ton lie, you know, in a parallel position, of course, you know, so that, you know, they're learning that movement. So through pretend play, mm -hmm. through um, age-appropriate stories, um, through um, – just imagination through props, all of these types of things you can get children to do um, so much more. And pretend play, I think that that's a really interesting thing. For those of you on the line, I'd just be kind of curious if you guys, how much of you are really em embracing pretend play as one of the, the core things of your teaching? And, and Beverly, what have you found to, like why is that so successful? And, and what does Annie say why pretend play is so essential for child learning? This is what Annie says all the time. It is their job. It is the job of every two to seven year old to pretend play. That is how they organize information in their brain. So it is their job. It's what they are meant to do. That is how they learn. So if you make it into a story, if you bring, um, even if I'm going to teach a movement, um, uh, we call it flamingo passe retiré, where I want their knee, their foot to come up to their their knee and yes. parallel, of course, because they're little and they're not ready for rotation. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to relate it to a flamingo because they know flamingo. They know they've seen those pink birds, you know, that stand on one foot. And so if I want them, to, yeah. <laughs> the thing is, the knee goes backwards, but not no one's pointed that out to me. Yeah. Pay <laughs> <laughs> with later. Imagination so, or imaginatory flamingos. Exactly. So if I want them to step across the floor doing step flamingo passe, step, you know, I want them to be able to step, shift their weight, pull their foot up to their knee, step, shift their weight, pull their foot up to their knee. If I said that to them, they'd go, huh, what? But if yes, I said, exactly. flamingos, and we're going to walk across our pond to see our friends on the other side. And then we start our step flamingo passes and we wave to our flamingo friends. You know, so it becomes a story. It becomes play. And it's so much fun to teach. Mm. Yeah? Mm. So, I mean, we get to, you, I mean, I'm, what I loved about teaching, especially little ones, was just how silly you could be. I mean, it was the most fun you'd ever have. And to be down on the floor with them and, and you know, to really – you know, for us to bring out our kind of childlike playfulness. I mean, that's mm -hmm. often when you had the most fun with the classes. And how yeah. do you find, like, teachers? I mean, like, sometimes that can be uncomfortable and, and it's a, it can be like a bit of a learned skill to become comfortable. How do you help teachers to really, you know, really embrace that whole joyful factor of being, being silly is part of the teaching? Well, I think once you start doing it and you see how the children react and become engaged, that you would you don't want to go back to the old ways. You want to yeah. stay, you know, fully animated. I mean, I am more tired from teaching an hour long early childhood <laughs> class than a two hour advanced ballet class because I don't have to do that for the advanced ballet class, but I do for the 
they're the little ones. But um, once you know why you're doing it and how to do it, I mean, you just there's just no other way. I mean, it just yes. works. They can learn so much more. You know, my four-year-olds know all their positions. They know all their port de bras and they know the real names of them. You know, yes. so it's like it's amazing what you can teach them appropriately for them, for their physical body, their emotional, their social, and the cognitive. So if you're if you're if you teach where that child is in that point of development, you're going to have success. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, what do you like? You know, in, even in your studio now these days, like what? Looking back on when we first started, because you know, hindsight's a really beautiful thing. Looking mm-hmm. back on when you first started, Beverly, what what do you do very differently? Even even kind of in terms of running the studio or kind of creating the experience, what do you do now totally differently than when you how you used to do it? And what's been the the see, secrets that you see to really providing that incredible experience that attracts and retains students? Well, I mean, when I first started my studio, I wanted a, you know, a classical ballet, high-level studio. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and then I was going to teach some kids. You know, but then it, now it's like it's all about teaching the little ones. You know, when I first started, even before I had my studio, and now it's you know, what I love is teaching all of the little ones. But mm-hmm. it's, it's to be able to think Think in, like, even in marketing and just everything about the whole experience of the child, uh, of the mother, of what they're looking for in a studio. And it's just now, um, it's a complete package. So, you know, now in my, my studio, I, so they just, they have to come in, they get their leotard, they get their tutu, they get, you know, they get everything. It's, it's full service. And I think that that's really key in today's world because parents are so busy and time is money and time is energy and things like this. So if, as a studio owner, if you can provide this complete package that is education-based and child-centered, you will, you will have success. You will stand Plus out. Plus convenient. Plus convenient, it sounds like. So just making yeah. it. Yeah. So I love that education-based, child-centered, and convenient. I've been the, like some of the real mm-hmm. core values of what yeah. you've done. So how else do you make it convenient? Because these are some of the like the really good things that uh, mm-hmm. can be so practical. Just how do you like to make it easy for parents? Because that is you know so desirable, and people oh. will kind of come to you because you make their life easier. Full stop. Right. Well, we um, we work with the scheduling. As far as scheduling, we try to get siblings on the same day. Now I do mm-hmm. have. Um, four studios in you know in one location, so I can have multiple classes going on. I didn't at first. I had one little tiny studio out in the country, but now I'm up in the city and I have you know four large studios. You know I've grown to this. You know it was a journey, uh, but so uh, scheduling so siblings are on the same day. Mm-hmm. That's one big thing. Um, we also have expanded our studio to where we're not just dance. We have aerial arts, music, other things for, you know, for siblings or maybe the child wants to add on classes. Um, we sell all of the dance wear, all of their needs. They don't need to go anywhere else. You know, they rip their tights, putting them on, no problem. They can get a pair of tights at the studio. We have all that for them. So it's yeah. about being full service, um, mm-hmm. sending out information, remind. We just really cater to that as far as, you know, having them um, – know the information and get it in multiple ways and checking up and that type of thing. It just, it makes, and, and I bet the feedback you get is quite just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Because it, it's, yeah. if we're thinking about like studio, like the professionalism, there are a few things that I've really learned, Beverly, it's like that um, um, speediness is an impressor, like prompt mm-hmm. replies, prompt, you know, and consistency mm-hmm, of communication, really. Like, yeah. if um, you can master those two things, you are doing very well. And I suppose yeah. it's a hard when we're pulled in so many different directions to be able to do that. Like, what are your kind of secret little tips and things that you do to kind of keep on top of, of helping make that happen? Um, excellent staff. <laughs> yeah, <thank you. laughs> I have an excellent staff. My my assistant is phenomenal. Uh, she's amazing. She you know she can handle things, multiple things. My receptionist. I just really having good people um, mm-hmm. that know what to do. Don't have to come ask me a thousand questions to make a decision. That can 
you know, they're, they're, they know what to do. They're trained. Now, also, all of my staff goes through the Leap and Learn training, so they understand all of the, the child development. They understand all of the parent-child interaction. We, you know, we teach Even all of that. Hmm? Even your admin yeah. go through it? Really? Yes, everyone, everyone goes through the Leap and Learn training workshop. Because in the, in the training, we not only talk about what you teach in that classroom, it's what do you do in that waiting room. You know, I I'm I like things in order. I'm one of these people that I don't like chaos. I don't like running around. I don't like any of those type of things. That you know, they it's it's not conducive to learning. And um, so our our whole studio it, it just works so well. You know, there's a system. We spend the whole month, the first month of class of the year, teaching. What do you do when you walk in the studio? What do you do? You go to the potty. You um, put your dance step on. You put your things over here. You go line up with the student assistant. You know, so all of that, it's just like a, you know, well-oiled machine. You just got to have everything. So everybody's trained. Everybody knows. In the training, we also, Annie does a whole thing on um, how to talk with parents. You know, if you, you know, it's very difficult sometimes, especially if you're a younger teacher, say, you know, mm-hmm. you're in, you know, you're 26 and you don't have a child yet and you need to tell a mom about, you know, their child, you know, possibly not being able to, you know, not doing well in class for some reason, you know, and so we teach how to, how to talk to them. So that's all part of it because it's not just what goes on in that classroom. It's the whole Mm -hmm. picture. It's the, Mm -hmm. the whole picture of everything, you know, in every phase you know, for everyone, the whole family. It's so true. And I, I remember even I spent a lot of time at Born to Perform in, in my studio really thinking about the impression when a parent first step, you know, set foot in the door. What, what did they see first? How were they greeted? What music was playing? What were the kids doing? Like, you know, thinking about that first impression because the learning, the tone of the tone is set in that instant and so you're right so really thinking and like being intentional around like okay well how can I create the best results for my clients and for the students by creating the best learning environment and that that is that is you're right it's so much more than just like when they go okay now in today's class it actually is way before that in fact it's even before they get to their first class before they even come to the studio really is when we set the tone how would you would you think oh definitely Definitely, definitely. We, um, in our, especially for our younger kids and all, we don't, you know how some, a lot of times you go into waiting rooms and you look and mom's on Facebook and the child's on mm-hmm. the, child's the iPad. <laughs> we don't like that. So I can't control mom on Facebook, but what we do as part of their class, when the child gets there and they go to the body and they put their things up, they, they don't get on online or do anything like that because that just really interferes with learning. So, because I want this child to be creative. And if you're always looking at a digital device and you're doing these games and these things on the digital device, it's doing all the creativity for you. You're just watching and reacting. And it's- Yeah, you're a passive participant. Mm. Yeah. So what we do is the child immediately goes to the student assistant. So we have student assistants for all our early childhood classes. And they immediately go with them. They sit in a circle or, you know, against the wall in a line waiting to go in. Or if it's the first class of the day, they they go actually into the first class of the day. And we read stories. And we talk about the stories. And we learn. And Mm. in Leap and Learn, there's monthly objectives. So you have certain things that you're focusing on every month. Well, I do that throughout my entire studio. So we, I have found all these wonderful children's books that we read to them that kind of bring all this in. So they're already learning, and it's 10 minutes before classes to start. Of course. So, you know, and the moms really like that because if they have to get across town to get brother to baseball, they know that their child is taken care of, you know, so that they can bring the child in, get her ready for class, and then they can go get brother to baseball and then get back in time. So mm. that's what I'm talking about full service. That that is full service, and my love is not even. They're not even just being taken care of. They're it's more than that. They're actually in a space where they're going to be learned. Yeah, and, and that is that is quite unique in 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 that approach. And I suppose for you, it's kind of like an investment in kind of paying that another teacher to be there early to be kind of providing that care. But that's really stand apart. A stand apart 
um, and that would be a big, I bet that's a big uh, attraction source for you as well. People come because of that to your studio. Right. Yes, definitely. Definitely. And the children stay because they want to be that student assistant. So, um, because the student assistant are actually my um, teen dancers. Yes. Okay? And, and what they do, I don't, um, we don't act, they're, they're in, we call it an internship. So they're learning to be teachers. And several of my really good teachers that are now older and in college or out of college started as a student assistant. Mm -hmm. They were in that student assistant and they've gone through the program and they know it. So my student assistants, actually, they're not paid. I reward them with a special part in the performance. So they will come and do this all year long. Plus they're learning to teach and they know that one day they, they might they might be able to have a job teaching. And calling it an internship is beautiful because it really does set that intention. Like they feel like, oh, I'm a, it's a celebrity status in the studio. Mm -hmm. like I can see you've come in a position with that. Yeah. <laughs> mm. And then again, again, I, what I love about that as well is it really goes back to that whole, you know, it's the, the older ones teach the little ones and that just keeps that studio family together and the connection. I mean, mm -hmm. wow, that's beautiful. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I really, that's just it's such a gem. I hope everyone on the line is kind of thinking about that, to think how could you create and facilitate with ease, you know, that experience that from the moment they set foot in the door, it's like, oh, this is so well thought out. This is so lovely in the experience that I wouldn't imagine going anywhere else because this is just so beautiful and Beverly do that. The lovely Emily McDonald has a question for you Beverly. She said, okay. I would love to know more about how you grew. Was it organically or did you take a big leap? How, so kind of looking at the history of your studio, what's been the kind of the milestones you've reached? Okay, so my when I first opened my studio in 98, um, I live outside of the city in a little small community and my studio was um, not far from my home. And um, I, most of my students were coming from the city, but, you know, and they were driving out and it just the whole traffic situation got mm -hmm. really difficult. But it was, wasn't until 2012, I think it was, I'm looking at my husband sitting right here, 2012 that mm -hmm. I moved to Lafayette mm -hmm. and I, I was going to build, but land was, you know, it was difficult to purchase and all of that. So I leased a space. And um, it was a huge job. So now I had three studios instead of this one little studio. My first studio was so small, and the ceilings were so low. When the girls did grand and they put their arms up, they got a Celotex in their fingernails. <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> so that's how I started. Okay, wow. that was the start. <laughs> Humble just, beginnings. <laughs> Humble beginnings. Plugging away, plugging away. Now I have 8,600 square feet of studio space. You know, one of my studios is 40 by 60 with 14 foot ceiling, so I'm good. Um, so it, I think, you know, I just the steady growth. Um, I'm known in the I'm known in the city as you know, yes, the um, serious ballet studio, but not not the serious ballet studio. You know, I'm known as if you want to go learn ballet, if you want to learn to dance, face on how, how you children learn, or, or if you want to go learn ballet where the, the body and safety is the most important. I don't force turnout. I don't force all of, I don't believe in all of those things. Um, I, everybody, you know, only have one set of knees, one set of ankles, all of these things, so it, it has to be taught correctly, whether you want to be a dancer or not. You know, if it's just something you're fun to do, and we teach with a lot of love and caring, but we do expect the children to have self-discipline. We do mm -hmm. expect them to do their part. And um, and if you teach that from the beginning, you you know you don't have all these issues. I mean, I do hear a lot of issues as I do my work, and um, you know throughout the world and all. And I think that's the thing is um, to be able to have children have their Self-discipline, self-respect. Mm. We are, uh, and working with you do, like, you know, having studio owners around the world in the Leap and Learn program now, what would you say, I mean, we talked earlier about a little bit about having 
um, the convenience factor and then being quite intentional around the experience when they come through the door. What else would you say, like if for those on the line who are looking to really grow their, their preschool program in particular, what would you say are kind of like the keys and the really, what's really attractive and when we're kind of thinking about designing this intentional preschool program and, and having, you know, becoming just renowned for it, what would you say that you've seen that studio owners do that really contribute to a phenomenal preschool program? What do you think are the essence, essential ingredients? Having a well-trained teacher in that classroom. Having a well-trained teacher, yes. Mm -hmm. Because um, that is, they, those classes really are your most important classes. They are the foundation of your studio, they are bread and butter of your studio. And you, making sure that, um, you know, the mom is turning their child over to you for 45 minutes, an hour, whatever. You know, that it is somebody that starts class on time, ends class on time, that you can see progress. You have to be able to see the progress from year to year and throughout mm -hmm. the year. And um, also being able to uh, communicate with the parents what the children are learning. You want to bring the parents into their learning um, situation, their learning experiences. You know, you don't want to be a babysitting service. That's not what I, you know, I, I am a school. You know, I'm an education-based curriculum. And so, and you want to share that with parents and um, bring them in with, you know, you know, just for example, like giving out coloring sheets that have the stuff they learned that day with the name, the French word underneath, underneath, you know, hey parents, this is what they learned. You know, little things like that can make such a difference. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's mainly, um, I think, to really value and not it's it's important to don't just be thinking about your older dancers okay yes think about your older dancers but know that those younger dancers are just as important mm. you know? in fact they're the they're the future I mean that's like the pyramid of the mm -hmm. studio model like these are this is just so much your bread and butter and as we concentrate on this area and we retain more that's when the business goes from kind of like this to like exactly. to this exactly and I find that what happens is a lot of times um, teachers get stressed out about all the stuff that's going on um, emotionally, socially in the older classes. Yes. And then by the time they get to their little classes, they're tired, you know? So and they take the most energy sometimes, like you said earlier. The little ones, I, you know, that's where you got to bring your, bring all your fun back. Bring that in there. So making, you know, having qualified educated, trained teachers leading those classes that love children, that love children, that you can really tell they love teaching. Mm -hmm. The parent can tell. You can tell. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. And, and our retention rule reflect that as well, very, very clearly. Mm -hmm. So we've got some questions coming in for you on Facebook, okay. Lovely Beverly. So... <laughs> Um, lots of them. I'm just going to pick my favorite one so far. Um, Beverly, how did you go from running a dance studio to developing a dance curriculum and training teachers over the world? Is it difficult to run both businesses? Which do you prefer? <laughs> Which is kind of a timely topic for you. I know. Um, yes. Beverly is one of the, I'll just rephrase, I'm going to kind of answer this to begin with. Beverly is one of the hardest working women I have ever met in my life. Beverly is still teaching. How many hours a week, Beverly? Don't tell me, actually. I'll be, I'll be. <laughs> Beverly still <laughs> teaches, and she's there running classes every single week and, uh, and you know, still manages to create this incredible legacy through Leap and Learn, which is a phenomenally, you know, so this program is growing leaps and bounds um, and turning it into like an online delivery of the, the curriculum as well. So Beverly, I'll let you answer now, like, how did you go from being the teacher to then developing Leap, or well, maybe like Angelina Ballerina was kind of an introductory step as well. So do you want to talk about how you actually went now being who you are? Well, when, when Annie and I, you know, I was teaching, I, I, I wanted to share what was, Leap and Learn was working, so I was doing it internally. Everything gets tried out in my studio first, and it was working beautifully. And a lot of my friends throughout the country like, well, you need to do this. And then um, 
Aquinas Shang from New York, the ballet master, he was also, he believed greatly in me, and he was like, why don't you teach in my workshops? And that's how I kind of got started teaching at workshops. He says, I think you have so much to offer, because mm -hmm. I was at his workshop <laughs> and learning, and then people would ask me questions, and then that kind of developed in, Beverly, why don't you teach for two hours at the end of the day? And then, mm -hmm. you know, then I ended up having my own workshop, and it just kept growing and then I was invited to teach at conferences and you know and I've been doing that for years ever since well since 2004 mm -hmm. um, but it it just it kind of organically grew and I wanted to share everything that it was working for me so why not share you know mm -hmm. why not share and um, it but the studio you know the studio was, I still had the studio the studio was growing at the same time and um, it just, let's say, I drink a lot of coffee and I eat a lot of chocolate. She <laughs> <laughs> doesn't sleep much. Our lovely friend Beverly doesn't sleep much. She's, she's prolific. <laughs> she is prolific. It's pretty exciting though. I mean, like, it yeah. must be quite rewarding to see, you know, studios around the world working with the program that you developed. And that's why I think it's doing so well. Personally, why I, you know, as a, as a, you know, I have a teaching degree. I'm a teacher at heart, teacher first. And when I'm looking, you know, at all the different programs, I want to know which one is educationally the most sound. And that's what I really value about Leap and Learn because it's so grounded in, in educational psychology, in child psychology, in child development. And, and when you employ that with pure technique, I mean, that's where your students just go, and, yes. and then, then learning becomes effortless. Their results, their progress becomes effortless because it makes mm -hmm. sense. And mm -hmm. that's what excites me about Leap and Learn. Yes. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, we've got some more questions coming in. Um, uh, Beverly, what are your key points for attracting families? Uh, stay true to your values. I, you know, in, I'm, I'm known as the studio that conservatively dresses the kids on stage. Mm -hmm. uh, when I do uh, performances, I actually write a children's story and we turn it into a ballet. And we're working on one right now, and the composer is creating the score. Um, you know, children are children. And I attract, and I want customers that have the same values as mine. Mm -hmm. And that's the key. Mm -hmm. And they talk. They talk. I mean, referrals is the main way that I get students is because, you know, one mom tells another mom and, you know, then they, they come, you know. So, but it's, it's like stay true to who you are, to what you, what makes you tick, what is, you know, in your heart and soul, and the right people will come. Because you don't want the people that don't share the same because it's just going to conflict. There's going to be problems. You know, maybe not when they're three through six, but hmm, when they're 14, 15, 16, mm -hmm, yeah, they will be. <laughs> so, really you know, and if a student comes to me and they're not the right fit, when I first started, it used to just break my heart. But now I know, you know, that they're not the right fit for me. They're not the right fit for this studio because they have a different value system than what, mm -hmm. you know, the studio represents. So how do you identify that in the early days, and then what do you do about it? Like, how do you handle the situations when you see that you've got, oh, this is, I can, I got a feeling about this one. How do you handle that? Um, very delicately. Um, <laughs> I've had, um, I've, I've had one instance where I had to talk to a parent about a child's behavior, and um, she didn't care for what, you know, her child's never wrong, and. You know, it's just she got upset with me, and, and that's okay. That's okay mm -hmm. that, you know, because all your, the all the children are important. Everyone together is important. You can't just think about one child. You have to think about you have groups of children. So what is best for that group of children? Um, but, I mean, I had one teen student a couple of years ago mm -hmm. use foul language in the waiting room, and I spoke to her about mm -hmm. it, and, she did. I put her on probation and pulled her mom in and talked to her. And 
she did it again, and I pulled her mother and her in again, and she did it in front of her mother. And so, you know, and I just said, well, I don't think this is a right fit for you because you can't speak this way in front of children. And, um, you know, and they're no longer a student, and that's okay. You know, I can't change, you know, you only have these kids for so long. You don't have, you, you know, maybe an hour, maybe, you know, my advanced answer is maybe eight hours a week I'm with them. I'm not their main influence. You know, I don't, I don't have enough time with them. So if your values don't align, if this family's values don't align with your values, you know, there's going to be issues. So, um, and you just have to remember that and say, it's okay. There's something for everyone somewhere. And it took me a long time to get to that point. It takes strength. It takes strength to be able to say, to be almost to be able to be confident enough in the experience you provide and, and, and your intention for the studio to be able to say, thank you. And mm -hmm. I think we, I think another studio might be that saying no is is the most terrifying, but also quite an empowering thing to do because. The moment I believe that when you do say no, that's when it's almost like you are you are holding strong to the quality you're passionate about providing, and by sticking to the values of that, that's when everything shifts. So I'm really curious, like what what would you say, Beverly? Are your core values for your studio? Like what what are you passionate about delivering, and and what do you stand for, and what don't you stand for? I suppose. Is the question. I stand for um, respect, respect of others, respect of you know your teachers, the the receptionists. Are you there? The parents. Hello. Can you, hello. Ah. Hello. I just lost. I can, I can yeah. hear you, but Thank I can't you. see you. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay. You can hear me. Hello. 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 I, I I just was not sure if the can you see me now? It should be kind yeah, of. Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, and I can hear you. <laughs> Don't you love? Yes. You can hear both. Technology. <laughs> uh, so so okay. please. Oh, I forgot now. Technology. What are your values? And what you? My core values. My core your values, values, lovely one. I know. It's, I'm sorry. My bad. My, my core values are um, respect of others, um, using using the arts to teach about life but and keeping children mm -hmm. children and uh, treating children as children and holding mm -hmm. on to childhood as long as possible um, I'm very strict about costuming I'm very strict about um, I have a dress code I have a dress code within the studio and everybody's expected to follow the dress code and we do a color system and I kind of took that from my son's uh, karate school because he couldn't wait to get the next belt. So yes. each level, you know, the threes have one color, the fours, the five, all the way along, all the way to the advanced dancers. Um, I expect you to follow dress code. You know, just things like that. It's just this, this, is, this is what I expect of you, and this is what you can expect of me. And it's all in writing, and it's all ahead of time. They know, all the parents know. We have a sticker system within our studio. The parents know upon registering that there is a sticker system for the little ones. It's a positive discipline thing that's developed by Annie, Dr. Spell, and it works beautifully. And um, so things like that, it's just um, I don't, I use a whole lot of instrumental music. I do use some music, but I'm very, I'm just very, I, I worry about children growing up too fast, to be honest with you. I could see it happening. I could see it happening when I was working with um, other studios before I opened my own studio, and it just concerned me, just mm -hmm. uh, lack of respect. And um, I want you to, um, when you come to my studio, you have to want to be there. You have to want to work and take great pride and value in, in that work and what it can do for you. And it's amazing the letters I get um, from students that have gone through the studio and then, you know, gone away to college and got married and things that they write to me. And 
you know, one of my, my closest of all is one of my students, and she was a teacher of mine who went on to become a nun. And um, wow. I know, and she's just the most adorable person in the world. And, uh, you know, I get letters from her a couple times a year, uh, still talking and, you know, saying all that I've taught her through dance. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's, you know, th those are the Very things beautiful. that I cherish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what I really love about what you've just shared about when you when you design an experience that that so beautifully reflects what you stand for. I mean, I truly believe, and you guys can write this down, that um, the best student experience is the best marketing you can do. Creating a creating a good solid experience, you won't actually need to advertise. People, it will organically grow your studio so so rapid fire you won't even believe it. It's kind of thinking about what do they want, what would knock their socks off, what will keep them for mm -hmm. X amount of years. And if you can think mm -hmm. through that process, and which is what we really teach in the SEP really, when mm -hmm. you can think through that and then systemize it, that's when you are unstoppable. You are mm -hmm. unbreakable. And sure. it also for you is becomes, I know, I think for me Beverly, it, that's when it becomes really a joy because it, it works and you've got then the confidence to know what you stand for and then you're okay to say to some students, no, this is, that's, that's not, not our vision. And so how did you get to that point, Beverly, of, of having the confidence really to, to say what you want and to really make the harder decisions to change things? Because like, that's often quite a tricky thing to manage when you've got a big vision of what you want to do, but right now things are quite different. How did mm -hmm. you start rolling out the changes in your business to, to get to where you wanted to be? I just, I, I was confident in knowing that what I believed and what I felt, there were other people out there too. Now, believe me, sometimes I felt like, am I the only one that thinks that it's, it's okay, you know, that thinks it's not okay for this, you know, and, but there are a lot of people out there that feel the same way that I feel. And that's what I'm finding also with Leap and Learn, that, that studios are finding me and saying, wow, okay, now I have, because I have the education, because I have all of these mm -hmm. tools, I now can stand true to what I, I believe. I mean, I've had many teachers who go through Leap and Learn to tell me, I'm a better parent now. I'm mm -hmm. a better parent now. You know, and that just went, you know, was like, wow. Oh. <laughs> like, wow. You know, and um, so it, it, it was definitely a process for me to be able to go through the step, but I just stood true. Why did I open my studio? Why did I open it? I opened it because I thought that, you know, all children need to be taught the correct way, and I'm not a babysitting service. I am a school. It's, it's all about education. It's about the, 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 the easy way is not the right way. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. sometimes things are tough in life, but, you know, going through the toughness and being able to do those plies again and do that combination again and do that, well, how much is that going to teach that, that child, you know, for later on in life when things are tough? You know, yes, and that's, yes. the, that's, that's the key is that that's what I learned from ballet. That's what I learned. Mm. And, uh, you know, I had a wonderful teacher. I had wonderful experiences. Yes, I had some very negative experiences, too, but I learned from that, too, you know. Yes, but that makes us better teachers as well. Here. How did I, you know, one of the ways that I can manage all the things that I'm managing right now is I learned to do it while I was trying to train to be a professional dancer and go to school and be an A student and, you know, all that. And I was drinking coffee and talk like that, too. <laughs> She's your classic overachiever, my friend. She really, <laughs> truly is. She truly is. But it, again, it's like, what are we teaching them? And that's a really good thing to hold to in our studios of yeah. what really is that we want to teach. And Sarah's just, Sarah's just written in, how do you create such an experience when you don't have your own space, when you hire a hall and you cannot leave any of your things there? So you spend time running around setting things up so classes can start. Sarah, that's how my studio ran. We hired community centers and churches and school halls and things like that. And so we would schlep 
the boxes and then we would lay the tables out and then we would put the tablecloth down and we'd bring out the little portable CD player and we'd put the music on and, and mm. really set the tone. We'd have the signs up. So, you know, and, and even um, on Team Expansion, lovely Trish Denzel, she has a huge preschool program called Little Ballerinas and, and, you know, she operates out of the same kind of areas and her attention is unbelievable. She has such thought process down to the every detail just like Beverly thinking through when they come through the door even if this is in a church how can I create that level of identity that level of experience when they walk through the door and if that means getting there 10 minutes earlier and paying her teachers 10 minutes earlier for setup time that's what Trish does and I think that that's what Beverly is thinking as well and if, if you can take something from this training today Sarah I would probably suggest that, that it's how can not how that doesn't need to limit you necessarily. We can be creative and we can be thoughtful, and that is what's going to be probably one of the the tweaks you can do that will help to you know again just make it more wow factor. Which the mm -hmm. wow factor is what brings the students through the door. Would you say, Beverly? Right. right. Oh, it is. It is. It's the wow factor. You know. You know. I even down to. I have flowers at the front desk when you walk in. I have the little. Um, vapor mister thing that has a great oil, the happy oil, and, you know, things like that, just that whole when you walk in, it's, it's not only having a clean space, which, yes, if you don't have your own space, you're going to have to maybe get there a little bit earlier and make sure it's clean, you know, um, suitable, but just that, you know, when you walk in the studio, I can't tell you how many parents go, oh, it smells so good in here, you know, it's the dance studio. <laughs> And I've got, I got to say, that's quite rare. Most, <laughs> most dance studios I go to don't smell lovely. You know, but those, are, those, those little touches, it's to, it's to all the senses. Yeah. But that's how we teach also. It's you mm. want to bring in as many different senses as possible. Yes. So it's not only oh. in the classroom. You know, we teach using multiple modalities. And, you know, we want to see it. We want to hear it. We want to feel it. You know, all of those mm. things. Um, but in the waiting room and all the other things that you do, it's the same thing. It's it's a, a that is so cool. I was just I just wrote down like the sensory studio. So thinking about you know when they walk through that door, what do they see? Like do a visual audit. What are the colors? What are the textures? What are the kind of how are things looking? What are they going to hear? Is there music playing or is it kind of glass quiet? Clean. Yeah. It's glass clean. Is the glass co very simple, very important? Mothers notice these things. You know, what are they going to smell? Is there a candle burning? Is there essential oil? What are they going to feel? How are they going to be greeted? How are they going to feel? What's the other one? Taste. Okay, you could have, you know, one of those water pitchers with, you know, you could do so, you could do things like that. But thinking about the approach from a sensory level could just add a whole other level. That's interesting, Beverly. I quite like that actually. There's a lot of room to play with that. Mm-hmm. Mm. -hmm. mm. Interesting. Yeah, this is saying like this is revolutionary. Maddie says I'm going to add flowers and smelly scents into my studio now. Um, Make sure it's a clean scent, not a perfumey scent, because some people. What don't. do you mean by that? What do you mean by um, clean scent? Like I use the essential oils, but it's just a very clean, like a, a lemon, a little bit of yeah. lavender. You know that mm -hmm. type of that type. Not of, too much pot puree. No, to, no pot puree. Yeah, not pot puree. Not a perfume, because some people are mm -hmm. allergic. But just, yes. it's like a clean, it's just a little oil, smell. I get it, it's called happy. And it, it, we call it our happy, our happy smell. Happy smell. But, but we all like happy that. smell. That's the I bet it would. I bet it would significantly make a big difference. Um, does anyone else have some more questions they want to ask Beverly? I think I've got another one here. Um, this, um, gorgeous. Um, Carlos just said, oh, cleaning. Cleaning up after 200 dance kids and parents is the hardest thing about the job. I totally agree. Um, Nicole has written in so that I couldn't write in before, but it made me feel better when she said that her first studio had such low ceilings. That's my studio now. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it is I was there. I was there for a long time. And at the end, to be honest with you, I was scared to take the step. You know, it's like, oh, can I do it? Can I do it? Can I do it? You know, and finally, I just, my husband and I made the decision, okay, we're going to go for it. We're going to do it. And we did, and you know, but it took me a long time to, not only financially, but also, you know, in in here and here to be able to say, okay, I can do this, and um, and we've grown more, you know, since that okay. first step. So, 
it is it is definitely the decision that comes first. We've got other people like Linda saying, "Oh my God, I totally love that you want kids to be kids and really love um, really value keeping kids young with costuming, etc." I feel 100% the same, and sometimes feel like I am the odd one out. I love, love, love your values. Janine said, "I love that. I too believe that children are growing up too fast. Thank you for paying attention to that." Um, yeah, Marcy saying, "Amen. Children should be children as long as possible." Um, so this is just again so lovely. He was saying, um. Uh, Diane, lovely Diane, saying, Beverly sets the benchmark for care and integrity. Just wonderful, beautiful. Sandra saying, I love this info. It's just great. So, um, Beverly, I'm just, it's been so lovely. We could chat. We could just keep on chatting like this. But I would love to thank you. And for everyone who's on the line and you've been listening to her beautiful integrity and intention and value, what's been the biggest, your favorite thing that you've learned listening to Beverly today? What really resonated with you? What What's going to inspire you going forward? Um so we can kind of thank Beverly for her time with us today. Um, Jill has shared that great advice to stick to your values. You'll never go wrong. Uh, Maddie has said that Beverly is amazing inspiration. Isn't she just? She's remarkable. Uh, Chantelle has said to stay true to your values. Sandra said her enthusiasm and her love of sharing. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, it's, it's um, for those of you who are with us for Karen, how similar are there the main threads that you're noticing here about like when we're looking at really what is the heart of between the both two messages it's kind of been coming back to sharing and collaboration and putting children first and the learning first these two women that's why I love them both um, Suzette said keep the kids young and Charlotte who's in France she's a, in Paris Beverly um, so she's it must be the middle of the night for her. She said, Mercy, I've gained so much confidence in one hour. I so agree with what she said. Thank you, lovely Anne. Um, Gail said, keep learning, and no matter how hard it is, just go for it. Uh, Carla said, stick to your values, and you'll find the right clients. Janice said, creating a sensory experience. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. That's such a cool thing for us to think about more, Janice. Lisa said, uh, education-based, child-centered. Lisa, you'll be meeting Beverly at our uh, evolution retreat um, coming up, so that will be really fun too. Tanya is saying, thank you so much. Five-star information all around. Rebecca said, I love the sensory advice for the studio. Smell is a big problem <laughs> for our small studio. <laughs> love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the feet. It's the feet. It's the problem. It's a problem. Feed and sweat. It's too good. Um, Janelle said, amazing advice again. All of it's been great, but I love the advice on working with the child psychology as well as setting a complete studio experience from the style of the teachers to the smell of the studio. Very cool. Uh, Emily said, sensory studio. I feel so excited if I stay true to my values, my studio will continue to grow too. Your studio and your program sounds beautiful. Renee shared, setting the tone, being creative and staying true to your values. Megan said, being okay that some students just don't fit. So, Beverly, thank you so much. You shared so much wisdom with these women and these studio owners here tonight. And I just know how grateful they are to have been able to learn from you and to really gain such insight into what is important and what we can continue to focus on to really, to really, you know, make a difference through what we do. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great time. You're welcome. Keely Anna she said, I've loved everything. Um, is the Leap and Learn available in the UK? Yeah, if you head to leapandlearn.com, um, you can kind of find out more about the program too. 